I'm also the moderator tonight. Um, so my day job is with Higher Networks, a recruiting firm, and I'm their director of consulting services. So I do IT and contract staffing. And so tonight's panel is a group of friends from the industry that are talent acquisition professionals to help us um, navigate how to land our, our dream job. The average IT professional changes jobs every 2.5 years. And now that AITP is a part of CompTIA, there's a huge focus for us on continuous education and training and certifications. And so while many of you may be happily employed in your current jobs, it's good to know what's happening in the market, what companies are looking for and hiring for, and what are the trends, so that you know what to focus your training and education on now, so that when you are in a position to change jobs, out of need or necessity or want or desire, you are now marketable, and so um, making sure that your skills stay fresh and current is part of what we're going to do today. So I'd like to ask my speakers to join me up here. We're going to start with Brian. Oh, well, I'll call you when you oh, oh. <laughs> 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 <Corey> Brian, <laughs> Brian, Brian Bachelor, um, he's the founder of Talent Air. Um, he has um, been in HR and talent acquisition for about 15 years. His niche is primarily focused on IT and how to connect the right person with the right company at the right time. He's uh, the founder of a local Disrupt HR chapter, so talent acquisition and HR professionals in the room. If you haven't been to one of his amazing events, go to that. It's fun. It's disruptive. It's talking about all the trends in HR. And the right way. And we give you drink tickets. And then, yes. Complaints. <laughs> Rich. <laughs> <laughs> and he's the president of the Triangle Recruiting Association, formerly TTRA, but they've dropped a T, um, as well as the program chairs for Triangle Sherm Chapter. So welcome, Ryan. Thank you for joining us. I'm going to go with Mark next because I'm just following the script. Mark Weinberg is talent acquisition lead at Align Tech. They're the company behind Invisalign and Braces, and their new HQ is down the street from my office in Perimeter Park. Um, in September, Mark will be celebrating 20 years of recruiting and has grown up in both agency as well as as a corporate recruiter. This is his two-year anniversary, Mark, with Align Technologies, and he's been helping them grow from 36 employees to 300 employees in those last two years. So, welcome, Mark. Shailen Church has just gotten a promotion at Cree, is the talent management <laughs> program director now. Um, and he has about 10 years of recruiting experience with IT professionals in the DC market as well as the Raleigh market. Also came from the agency side, like many of us, and has made the segue into corporate recruiting. Last four years, he spent as a corporate recruiter with Cree <coughs> in Durham. At Cree, Trey has recruited for both the IT organization and a startup development team that focuses on embedded software and IoT applications. Pretty cool stuff. This is my <laughs> All right, so we're going to start with a couple of questions, and then we'll make sure it's interactive and you have time for your Q&A, because we want to make sure that everyone here gets in there. Where are the women? <laughs> <laughs> Well, now, are you a recruiter too? I work for a recruiting firm, but I'm on the sales side of the recruiting firm. She worked really hard to find all male. <laughs> diversity, so diversity works both ways. In recruiting, diversity is an all male panel. That is true. Next month, it will only be women on the panel because it's witty and it's women in blockchain. <laughs> Good answer. Sorry, I just had to mess with you. <laughs> it's okay. I mean, I'm the token woman. <laughs> so, all right. I had the question down here, but I'm going to go this way. All right. I'll let you all do a quick intro. Yeah, we have to pass the mic. Is there a Are we just, yes, no? Yes. No. 
Let's no, no, project. No. I don't project, uh, but I know he wants to record it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wants to record it. Ah. You do this more than me. This is fancy. There we go. Sure. So, um, so I work at, at Cree. So we are an LED and lighting manufacturer in Durham. Uh, specifically, when we hire IT, um, I'll just go really quickly. Um, we like to hire people who have long-term vision that have led big, large-scale, global transformations. We are moving from a very small company, uh, probably doubling in size, hopefully, um, in the next couple of years. So when we specifically hire. It's not just for the, okay, have you worked with Oracle or anything, but it's have you done these big, large-scale, rapidly growth uh, things. And then we also do uh, embedded in IoT devices. Um, so anybody that has experience in that area is another area that we hire a lot for. Thank you. Um, I guess I'm the rose between two thorns. Okay. Um, it's in the jacket. It's in the jacket, okay. Let me see a show of hands. How many people have heard of a line? All right, how many people have heard of Invisalign? Yes, so we are the makers of 3D printed Invisalign and straightens teeth. And our headquarters are in San Jose, but we opened up a location in July of 2015 with 13 employees. And then um, I came in about seven months later as their only talent acquisition person. So I, before that, I spent 14 years at the agency in a couple other companies before that. But uh, I have uh, recruited, like you said, 20 years, three years before that in St. Louis, and then uh, moved here in 2001. So, um, for as far as like openings and, and stuff that we work on, uh, a lot of our stuff is 3D, CamCAD, C++, programmers, a little bit embedded. Um, let's see, we, mobile apps, um, even it, you name it, we're pretty much hiring for it. Thank you. <laughs> so I'm uh, living on the other side of things. So I run a consulting firm and my niche is generally in the startup community. So I not only help them find talent, but I teach them how to figure out if it's the right talent for them. So I, get, I coach them basically on bias training, go through interview process, make sure that that is refined so that we don't have people doing interviews that really shouldn't be doing interviews. Um, so that's kind of what I do. My, my specialty has always been IT because I did information systems as my undergrad and then I decided that it was way less regulated to go in the HR world. Um, so I jumped over to the HR side and got my master's in HR and quickly landed in a recruiting seat uh, living in Hawaii and then jumped to Los Angeles, continued doing recruiting and then moved to Raleigh about six years ago now um, doing the exact same thing. So most of what I recruit for are data scientists, software engineers, it, it can go embedded, it could go web, um, kind of all over the gamut of web. And just an interesting fact that Kate didn't talk about. Well, I lived in LA, I also cheered for the LA Clippers. So I think I'm the only professional uh, cheerleader in the room. So, I mean, if somebody else is there, that's amazing. Congratulations. Uh, it, it was a, a wild ride. Anyway, that's a little bit about me. I didn't know if we were going to go there, the cheerleading part. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so the first question, and I'm going to start with Trey, is what are the hottest tech skills you hired for last year, 2017? Oh I feel like I just named them. Um, yes. I, so, so yeah, I guess to be more specific, right? If we're talking about the the biggest thing that we have hired for um, is embedded in IRT. Um, so, Cree specifically is developing a product line <clears throat> of embedded technology that actually goes into lighting systems that not just controls lighting systems, but also controls HVAC, controls security systems, 
can be sold to governments, can be sold to companies like Home Depot, Ford, to do a whole bunch of different things. Um, so any experience in that area is great for us. On the IT infrastructure side, you know, we, we have grown so far and so fast and so rapidly globally that we have a lot of patchwork, right? So we've got an office here, one in Racine, one in Arkansas, one in Canada, a couple in China, and everybody is on different systems. I'm sure some of you have had this problem in previous companies. Um, so we are looking for people that will help us, and we have been hiring people that will help us bring everybody together on the same system that's scalable and global. <clears throat> Not necessarily anything specific, right? Like we do use Oracle, so things like that are important. Um, but more of people, I guess, that have that cultural mindset of like, let's help us get there. Let's not just be the vision leader and say, how do we get to point B, but also the person that wants to roll up their sleeve with their teams and get the work done. Um, for me, I'll, <clears throat> we hired, for me personally, it was uh, mostly, um, the programs that I mentioned before, also a lot of DevOps, um, uh, machine learning, uh, you guys talked about it, dinner AI, we had um, a lot of uh, machine learning openings this sh uh, last year. Um, project managers, uh, business and an analysts, um, yeah, let's see, a lot of quality assurance, a lot of, um, Positions within our mobile app team, both Android and, and iOS. I think that's. So for me, it, it kind of split between the different eras of last year. So the beginning of the year, for whatever reason, was a lot of build and operations, which a lot of people call DevOps. To me, that's a little bit different. But anyway, um, so it was a lot of building operations and what I saw with a lot of the startups was instead of looking for people that could do AWS they were jumping into GCE and specifically people that knew how to run Kubernetes and start to automate some of those processes. Um, the middle of the year for whatever reason had a huge spike in Python engineers um, but had to be people that not necessarily knew how to jump on the front end but were willing to do so. Um, to, to me, there, there's no real thing called a full stack engineer. It's people that have their niche and are interested in being a team player, right? Um, but I saw a lot of Python engineers in the, in the kind of May to, to August timeframe. And then at the end of the year, it switched over to um, data stage and data architects, um, specifically on the JDE and moving uh, slightly away from Microsoft, but JDE and Oracle side. Okay. All right, resume tips. How long, what to include, what not to do. I'm gonna say. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna preface this conversation by saying that to be a client of mine, you can't use resumes. That said, um, I do a, re a lot of resume talks and I write them professionally. So every manager is slightly different. My rule is three positive bullets about yourself. Not correlating it to the job description, but correlating your experience as I set up 300 nodes in this system, right? Or I was able to contribute to this open source project for those students out there. You know, I, I committed this. Whether it got accepted or not, I at least did these 30 commits in GitHub. So putting that in the resume, to me, means a lot more than is it one page, is it three pages? It's how can I get myself through this ATS that's kicking 99% of people out, right? So make it long, and then when you get that in-person interview, make it nice and pretty. <laughs> For me, this is probably more about personal preference, um, but you're right, every our manager is different. Um, I'm more of a, if you have your summary on your pay, on your resume, I'm not a huge fan of that. I'm more of a objective of what you're looking to do and treat it like a cover letter. Um, you can change it for each job. That's the way I look at it. Um, as far as length goes, I 
mean, I wouldn't go into anything longer than four pages, but seven pages I've seen managers reject those. This is too long. Um, let's see, what else? Um, I'm gonna go along the same lines here. Is I used to, I call this the um, so what test. So if you put a, a bullet on your resume that says, I have developed four applications in Java. Okay, well, so what? What have you done with that? Tell me a little bit more why you did that. Uh, expand upon that. It's just not going to tell me much if you just tell me how long or um, or what you tell me what you've done with it as opposed to just what you're doing. So, and and you're looking at some people write a job description on their resume as opposed to what they've actually done. I guess this is where I say the opinions are my own. <laughs> no more than three pages, period. Um, if, you, if you do anything past three pages, I guarantee you what is going to happen to your resume is they're going to look the first half of the first page, quickly skim, maybe not even look at the second page, and we'll go all the way to the bottom of the last page and just see what's on the bottom. Guarantee you that is the way it happens at 98% of establishments. Um, so we say no more than three pages. Uh, for me, I mean, they, they've hit on some really good points, but I want to know that you understood what your job did in the bigger context, right? At Cree, we want to know if you understood the whole project. There are a lot of really, really large companies where you are siloed and you knew you're part of your project, but you didn't really understand how it fit into the big picture. You didn't understand how it affected the big picture. Um, one common, I mean, maybe we'll talk about this, one common question we'll ask people about their history and when they tell us about what they worked on is, tell us about when you had a problem and that didn't work, what did you do? And if your answer is, we moved it to a different team because it was a different team's job, it just doesn't work out. So we want people that understand that. <laughs> One quick thing, um, the skill set is what gets you through the ATS, right? So your keywords at top, bottom, wherever you decide to put keywords are what gets you through the ATS. What gets you through us is correlating those keywords with when you actually did them. So if you're putting Java, SQL, MySQL, all these different catch words or keywords and then we don't see them anywhere in the jobs that you've had or the projects that you've worked on, they mean nothing. I could have put those same words on mine, right? So putting those keywords somewhere on your resume, even if it's in white font in the footer to get you through the ATS, put them in the job description or in your job so that we know, oh, okay, cool. He did that or she did that four years ago could be relevant depending on the topic, or, oh, that's what they did this last job, or what they're doing currently. That's important for us to know. All right, what is the importance of my LinkedIn network and my profile, and how often do you view it if I'm an applicant? I'm gonna start with Mark. That's fine, thank you. <laughs> um, so, as far as a LinkedIn profile, I think um, robust, that's my personal preference, um, as far as the amount of stuff uh, that you have and that you've done. Now, one of the things you may not realize what recruiters will do is um, we'll look at your resume and then we're gonna look at your LinkedIn profile and we're gonna see if it matches, okay? And we're gonna make sure that what you said on your resume is what you said on your LinkedIn profile because you're going to be honest on your LinkedIn profile. That's the important part for me. Yeah, you took the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> uh, every single applicant gets a LinkedIn view by both me and the hiring manager. I mean, it's, it's almost a guarantee. And it's not even that you have to have the picture or have to have that, but just, just some more detail. In fact, I tell people, you know, if I'm advising you what you should do personally, it does not have to be a carbon copy of your resume. Obviously, the jobs should line up in the titles. Maybe it could be a little bit different take on it or a little bit more information. Um, but definitely every link to the profile is going to get looked at. Um, sometimes managers love to see, this is not a universal thing, what groups you're a part of. Do you have a passion 
for your job outside your job. So if you are a Java developer, are you on the Java developer groups? Are you, you know, asking questions or whatever? Um, it, that's not a, that's not an across the board thing, but people love to see that too. Yep. <laughs> so how many have Slack? Anybody? Anybody using Slack? Or HipChat? Or insert inner office communicator here? So for me, I do a lot of recruiting on Slack. I don't go to LinkedIn for sourcing people because I deal in IT and most of us know that, that LinkedIn is really just a resume database, right? So I recruit on Slack. But with that, LinkedIn is what I end up sending my clients. I don't do resumes. So if your LinkedIn is not up to date, what the client gets is not up to date. If they don't correlate or you don't have any bullets in your LinkedIn and you just have your job title kind of to the, the Java developer thing, so what? We can't see anything that you've actually done. So to me, LinkedIn is, is very important only because my clients that's their only preview of you, other than what I give them. Can I dive a little deeper on the importance of your LinkedIn network and who you know in, in common, not just the content on your LinkedIn, as well as endorsements? Is there any credit to endorsements or did LinkedIn screw it up when they pre-fed you what to endorse people for? Sorry, that was Jake. <laughs> no, endorsements do not matter. It, it, it's just, it's too easy for me to go online literally and find every single person I'm connected with and just click endorse, 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 endorse. It, it, it's silly. Um, some people have asked about the recommendations. Eh, to me, I mean, unless it's a really amazing over the top and there's some specifics in there, that also doesn't matter. Um, connections is good. I mean, it's good to be networked and in the group, but like I said, to us, it, to me, it's more important. What are you doing outside of your job? Is it your passion um, or is this just a job? So who you're connected to doesn't matter as much to me. As far as the networks go, I think it's good for you to be have a pulse on what's going on in the, in the environment out there, in the, in the industry. So having a robust network of people that you can rely on and bounce ideas from, but ultimately it's you with the skills getting that job. You know, what's the old saying? It's uh, not it's not what we know, it's who you know, right? Which is kind of sometimes are relevant, but mostly it's all about, I, I have to say it's more about the content. The only thing that wasn't mentioned is it's easy, the more detail you have on there, like your resume, you mentioned, you know, one bullet point about what your title was and how long you were there. But it's easier as, as recruiters to be able to find you if you have more of those buzzwords on there. Yeah, I completely agree. Endorsements, yeah, I've got a bunch of, as a Python developer. I'm not a Python developer. <laughs> so, <laughs> how many endorsements you have are worthless. However, those keywords that allow them to be endorsements are how people that source on LinkedIn, that's how they find you. And I think you're up to 110 skills that you can put inside of that little endorsement area. So put them all on there, okay? The same with the recommendations. If it's not something awesome, we're gonna be calling references anyway. So those don't matter a whole lot to us. Um, yeah. Is that the right answer? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is going to be a funner one. What are your biggest peeves about job applicants? This is more like the what not to do. Who wants to start? <laughs> Where do I begin? Um, first of all, I f a lot of times you'll apply to positions, which is great. Then you apply again, and then you'll keep applying to multiple jobs that don't fit your resume at the same company. So for us, it's hard to determine what you're going to do or what you can do. So, and we're not sure if you want to be able to do all of them or can do all of them. So it's, you know, stick to what's in your lane, I guess would be one of my... Um, what percent? Is it like 80% skill fit? 
percent, ninety percent. Oh, um. So what you're driving on? Yeah, I I would say fifty, sixty percent. You know, because then you know we're all not perfect, right? We cannot write perfect resumes. But if you've got a fifty to sixty percent chance of being able to do that job, I'm gonna be picking up the phone and calling you and figuring out if you are another fifteen percent better for that job. And most likely you are. <laughs> Yeah, and, and I will add to that that minimum qualifications have to be met, right? If it is, if there is a, literally a section that says minimum qualifications, you have to meet those minimum qualifications. Um, you know, I would say, what not to do. yeah, what what not to do. So, I, I we do have people that will apply to every single job. You know, like we do hire engineers, we hire manufacturing employees, and we will have. CEOs of former companies who apply to every single job, including an entry-level operator that makes $10 an hour. And then it makes it extremely hard for the recruiting team to figure out like, what is the end game here. Um, we send, if, if you're not a good fit for the job, we do send everybody a message. I don't even mind people responding back to the message. Um, what I don't like is that just because recruiting has such a bad reputation overall, and people are used to not hearing things, that we will get messages back from people that are like, well, you don't know what you're talking about, right? And that just does not set a good tone. <laughs> um, maybe ask, like, what am I missing? Or other jobs, what I love to hear is when people ask me, like, can I just talk to you anyway and find out where I could be a good fit at Cree and, and learn? So um, I would say just kind of watch the tone of the responses to the emails, um, especially if you're frustrated. Because your people not realize. Yeah. <laughs> So my biggest one is do your research first. There's nothing worse than someone that lives in downtown Raleigh and they apply for a job in downtown Durham and it's the perfect fit and you talk to them, they're good with the commute, they're good with the commute, they're good with the commute, offer gets in front of them, it's more than they ever wanted, doing the job that they dreamed of, and realize that they don't want to do that commute during rush hour, right? A lot of companies are flexible about that, but it makes us look bad. It eliminates your candidacy for that company and potentially for me. So do your research before you even venture into that world. Yeah, and I think that aligns with know your motivations, right? What is your must-haves for your next job, and what are the areas that you're willing to cave on? Yeah. I think the other thing is this might be more of an interview, but um, <laughs> always ask questions. Whether the recruit when the recruiter asks you what questions you have, don't say you don't have any. You always have questions. Always, you be curious. Um, <laughs> we'll go back to Trey on this one. What are the benefits of working with a recruiting firm? From either or both the client, you as the corporation, and the candidate perspective? So I've, I've worked at both, right? I've worked for a recruiting firm and I've worked at corporate. Um, so what I would say when I talk to people about working with recruiting firms is they have access to an unbelievable number of companies, right? Like they, you know, most of them might work with 70 plus firms in the area. It might even be higher than that. Um, they have access to jobs that are not posted. Generally speaking, as a corporate recruiter, if I'm sending it out to an agency, I'm not posting the job for some reason. Could be it's confidential. It could be that it's so niche we're not going to waste our advertising dollars on it. Um, when I use a recruiting firm, it is almost exclusively for either confidential searches or it is very niche. Um, so I, I like using firms specifically for very very hard skill sets. And when I say very hard skill sets, I'm not just talking about like it, well, everybody. I feel like always thought is like job developers, but I'm talking about has someone run your manufacturing IT operation before, like something super small, um, where if I post that job, everyone's gonna be like, well, I know that guy that does that job. <laughs> um, I recommend it. I mean, there, there are certainly good firms and there are bad firms. Do your research, make sure that you get along with that recruiter. It's more important than the firm. Make sure they're a very ethical firm um, that's not gonna submit your resume without being asked, um, and a couple of other things that, that I would recommend. Um, but 
overall, usually pretty good. Yeah, for, for me, I'm the same way. I've spent agency and, and corporate recruiting, and it's, um, you know, another set of eyes for you. Another way, you know, it's their full-time job to go out and network and um, build relationships with those hiring managers. So it's easier for them to do that, and that's their job, than it is your job to do. So you now you have somebody representing you in those in that company. I too have been on the agency and corporate life. Um, so two things that I, I want to kind of point out there, not only do your research on the agency, but do your research on the recruiter. Nothing, no bad feelings to the junior recruiters out there, but if you're a seasoned embedded engineer looking for a new role, chances are good they have no idea what you're talking about or what the client's talking about when they're asking for a firmware engineer versus in a, you know, just a regular C++ developer, right? So do your research on the recruiter and don't be afraid to reach out to them directly once you find the one that you wanna work with. Most of us, most of the, the agencies out there have very similar client relationships. So if you find the seasoned recruiter, Chances are good they have the same contact at Cisco or IBM or Red Hat or insert name here that the other agency does. So make sure that you're aligning properly with the recruiter that you wanna work with. From the corporate side, um, kind of like the no resume thing, I generally kick all the recruiting agencies out unless it's much like, Cree, like Trey does with Cree where it's very niche and it's it's, it doesn't make sense for me to go hunt for it because I'm gonna hire it one time ever. So that's that's the two caveats on the recruiting side for me. Can I go with Mark on this one? <laughs> what is the truth about employee referral programs? <laughs> All right, so, um, for me, it's the truth is that as an employee referral, you're more likely to get looked at by the recruiters, um, at least with with our company. Um, previous years, uh, we actually in 2016 with our company, we had 17% of our employees that were hired in Raleigh were through employee referrals. Last year it was 38%. So, yeah, exactly. I think industry standards like 33%. Um, I, I, you know, it's, I mean, we, we look at, we actually had, um, meet the recruiter day at our company and uh, everybody that came into the cafeteria had cupcakes and, um, we were able to, um, get, generate more referrals that way. You know, you're more likely to, to, um, stay with the company if somebody's referring you, you, um, it's a, just, it's, it's, it makes our job a lot easier. <laughs> I mean, frankly. Um, I think it's almost like two to one that you would stay with the company versus if I found your resume on, I don't know, X course website, that's my 75% to one, so. Yeah, those are amazing stats. Uh, <laughs> Cree, not so good on that. Um, but, but what I will say about employee referrals um, is that your resume is the front of the line. I, I don't even care who else has applied to this job. I don't care if there's 200 employees. I have an internal employee who is saying, you've got to look at this person, you go to the front of the line. Nobody recommends somebody that they think is gonna do a bad job, ever. It just doesn't happen. Um, <clears throat> employee referral. We will still do one, but it will go to the manager first. Like, hey, let's talk to this person. Because our mind is, if this is a really great person, they're not gonna be on the market very long. Um, so if you know an employee internally, send them your resume, that employee should man should message both the hiring manager for that role and the recruiter for that role. Um, but it's a great source. And like he said, the stats we found out at Cree, you're there twice as long and more likely to get promoted as an employee referral. And the person they referred you is more likely to stay. So there's there's good and bad, right? The, the companies out there like 
there's a particular company that I know about that gives ten thousand dollar referral bonuses if your refer e gets hired. It should not be monetary. You should want to work with people that are awesome, regardless of if there's a kickback for you. So I've seen the the downside of that, and it's up to the company to make an environment that enhances that, like the Meet the Recruiter Day. When I worked at Translope, we threw a, a game on party. So we just had a caterer and brought in some old school games like Atari and brought in DDR and Mario Kart and everybody just invited their friends, whether they were looking for a job or not. Because then I get to do what I do best, which is network and tell them that they are looking for a job, whether they are or not. <laughs> um, so, Referrals are amazing because those stats are the same at pretty much every company. They, they stay longer, they're generally better performers because they don't want to let that other person down. Awesome. I mentioned CompTIA. We're focused on education. We have a college chapter at a lot of universities. We're trying to expand that. We have some students today. What is your advice for new college grads? on how to get their first job out of college, maybe conversions of internships, maybe certs, degrees, training that are hot for them to be. Any advice, new college grads? Sweet. So I'm wearing my little orange sticker. You should always be a student. So for new grads, you gotta do something outside of your class. Your class is setting you up for success once you make that connection but you gotta do something real world. Just because you grabbed your CCNA, if you haven't actually programmed a professional network, you're not gonna be quite there. So do it at your house. It's still a project that you can talk about and you can speak intelligently about how you had to go troubleshoot this thing because your Wi-Fi wasn't connecting or you needed to set new administrator settings or whatever the case may be. Um, do something outside of your class that is teaching you what you're learning in that class. Um, my advice is to be patient. Um, you know, you're gonna get rejections. You're gonna get um, you're gonna get a job. I mean, it's just a, a matter of time. So be patient, and then when you're employed, be patient too. You know, you're not gonna be CEO in six months. Who here is a student looking for an internship? Oh, please come see me. <laughs> We're hiring 40 internships this summer. Um, so what, what I will say is, if you haven't started on internships and you're still in school, please do everything you can to find an internship that will set you apart from all of your classmates. If you have already graduated and you're looking for a job and you get an amazing offer that is 40K more than every other offer you've gotten, run. That is the reason that they are offering you 40K more. <laughs> Guaranteed you are not gonna like it, you're not gonna be happy. Lots of people learn that the hard way. But if everybody else is offering you 70 and you get this magical offer for 110, there is a reason. Um, that's my advice. <laughs> you will have no personal life. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You'll be working 80 hours. Yeah, you will be their slave. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So we all read the news, Raleigh is on the list for Amazon HQ2. If we are selected, what is your opinion on how that will impact the local Raleigh talent pool? More people driving Teslas. <laughs> I, I, I mean, Amazon is very well known for overpaying people because they put them in a uh, not as awesome environment, um, at least on the IT side. So I, I don't, I see it impacting our talent pool because we will have more talent moving to the area than we already do, uh, but people are still going to be looking for great people, and I don't know that Amazon will be the ones that attract them. <laughs> All right, um, so I'm, I have a double-edged sword here, I guess, when it comes to this. So uh, have you guys seen the scorecard and that Raleigh is actually the number one 
city. Um, so, for me personally, I think it's great, you know, for the economy. That's my personal opinion. As a recruiter, not please don't come here. <laughs> uh, although if you do come here, you're gonna keep me employed for a long time because there might be people that want to go there. But um, personally, you know, I think it's uh, a great thing. Please, please come here. That'd be great. I mean, I don't, I don't have any more opinion about that. Uh, come work with me at Amazon if they come here because I will be going. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, it's going to be the reality of, of it is going to be MetLife moved here with a promise of 1,000 jobs. And for 18 months, all everybody could talk about was MetLife. They dominated the market. They changed the pay rates for everybody in the market just by hiring 1,000 people. You're hiring 50,000 people? I mean, it, it's not hard to do the math of what is actually going to happen to the market. And if you don't own a house, buy a house very quickly because your property value is going to go way through the room. Um, but, but I think it would be great. Like I, I'm not that person that wants to, to shy away from it. It's too much. Um, I think it would it would change the face of Raleigh for the better. All right. I wanted to leave time for all of you. Those are all my questions. We will start with our friend Jerome. So I heard that. People don't. Do we have a mic. I don't, I, I'll speak up. I promise. You. I have kids. Um, <laughs> I, I heard that people don't leave companies and groups. They leave bosses, and particularly bad bosses. So if that's your situation where you've left a bad boss and you don't really have a good referral, how how do you deal with when you part on bad terms, but you still want the next good job? Yeah. Reference, bad reference. Yeah. Who wants to? Been there. So my, what I said to a company that asked about my references at a previous company that I had a horrendous manager was, look, we didn't have the best relationship, but I can give you three people there that you can talk to. Um, own it. You know, you, the manager, at least in my case, I got hired, so they apparently appreciated the honesty of it, but you're still giving them people that can talk about your professional experience. So I, I differ a little bit here. Um, I personally, did you did you learn from your experience there? I, I learned I never wanted to work with them again. Okay, <laughs> perfect. So to me, that was a learning experience, and that's what you need to tell them. You learn from that. But not about the company or the person, just in generalized, say, here's what I learned and here's what I'm looking for. Exactly. I hope you have someone like that and I'll work with you. you know, Perfect. Right? That's That would be okay. what you want to tell them. This awesome. is my preferred leadership style. Yeah. yeah. What is this manager's leadership style? Okay. Yeah. So what you didn't like, what you're looking for, and if people hear things like, you know, I don't like to be micromanaged, right. or things, they'll be like, duh, no brain. We don't want to micromanage you. Going people independent leaders that will work. Okay. Stay positive. Okay. That's what you need to do when you're on the film and stay positive. Okay. That's what I'm doing. Yeah, I was literally gonna say just I, it's it's not even necessarily that recruiter's business to know that you did not get along with your last boss, right? Like, and, and I would always recommend staying positive. It it is a really quick turn off to anybody that just talks a really negative about a previous company or a previous boss. Um, I would just focus in on the good things. I've, I've, and this happens a lot, right? Like it, it's a very tough conversation. I recommend you practice an answer. Um, I've heard really good things like, you know, it just, I've been with the company six years, I don't know, fill in the blank, change in management, and I just wanted to try something new, right? Like it, there are ways you can phrase it. But if you say like change in management did like my boss, they were a mean person. Like it just, it doesn't sound good. And even though it is probably true and they were probably a really bad boss, it is very hard for a recruiter and a hiring manager to hear that and not think warning bell, right? Can I just follow up on the, um, on the referral? So if you're currently employed, whether you have a good relationship with your boss or not, but you're currently employed and you're looking for the next opportunity, if you as recruiters, do you, um, are you mindful of maybe not calling your current <coughs> employer because, 
you know, that, that could yeah. muddy up the waters. If any recruiter asks you for your current manager's information, that is not a recruiter you should work with. Okay. You should get off the phone with them. If they work for a corporation like Cree, then you might want to consider a company that's not Cree. We would never do that, by the way. But I'm just saying, it is, it is, that is not okay. They should never ask you for that information. Um, yeah. All they're looking for is how they're going to profit on you. Okay. Yeah, they're just looking for a lead for them to call on their next person. Okay. So. And you are... You're okay to give previous employers as your references. It does not have to be your current employer as a reference, and they shouldn't check references until you are near an offer stage in the process with your permission. Okay. It should always be with a permission first. Yeah. Gotcha. Regardless of if it's an agency or a corporate recruiter. Okay. Thank you. So, if you're applying to startups or small companies, there are a lot of automated ATSs out there. So if you put your references in, there might be a little statement at the bottom that says they're going to automatically email those people and ask for references. So be very, very careful what you put on that application process. Um, yeah. Mr. Brad, do you need the mic? No. Okay. Uh, how important is it to show active participation in professional organizations related to your field of expertise. Frank, why are you laughing? <laughs> so, for me, when I moved back to Raleigh and decided that I was going to stick with this IT niche, kind of going to your point here, I made a commitment that I would go to three IT meetups a month. And the reason I did that is because my network went from I got nothing to within a matter of minutes I could have a candidate. It's the same with professional organizations. You might not be looking right now, but in three months, Cisco might do another layoff of 5,000 people. Or you have been in your role for two and a half years, and it's time for a new challenge. That network is what's going to get you that referral to get you in the door. And if you're not participating in those professional organizations, the only people that you know are the people that you're working with or the people that you live beside. I don't know that I could say that any better. It's like going on after the Beatles. <laughs> <laughs> So I will say, as, as I've said previously, it is hugely important. I want to see passion for your industry and what you do that goes above and beyond your job. And, and, and I don't mean that passion is in like you're in 10 organizations, right? But if you are in an organization that relates, it, it should feature on your resume. Questions? Gentlemen, over here. You guys, um, you talked a little bit about resumes and what you liked and didn't like. Did, you didn't mention anything about cover letters. Are those important or are they just additional data to get hung up on? <laughs> Thanks. Um, let's see, how do I do? Um, personally, I don't really read them. Um, I think, I mentioned this earlier about this, about having your resume and then having the subjective. Um, and curtailing that to the job. But the cover letter, I think, is good if you're um, maybe f one year, two years into your career. Um, but I'm going to, the first thing I'm going to do is go look at your resume. So okay. you guys might differ. Once again, opinions are my own. <laughs> but you'll understand why. Um, I will never apply to a company that requires a cover letter. Um, I, it's just, it's silly to me. I don't think I've ever met a recruiter, oh, well, I'm sorry. I've met several recruiters who claim they read cover letters, but I don't, I have never personally read one, nor have I met someone that could tell me anything about a cover letter. And, and it's hard because so many companies require it. So my recommendation is, I mean, you don't have to be like me and just be a snob and say, I'll never apply to these companies because there are a lot, but do create one that's you know slightly more generic that you can plug and play because I think it is necessary for a large majority of companies. Okay. One caveat to this though is some of our hiring managers will like, uh, do appreciate it, appreciate cover letters. Um, but they'll get to see that. I, I personally won't read it. 
So in general, recruiters spend three to five seconds on you and evaluating if we're gonna have a conversation or not, right? So you're, you're looking to spark our interest enough that we wanna dig deeper. Me personally, it's five seconds. If I don't see something in those five seconds that make me wanna learn more, then I move on, right? It doesn't mean that I'm ruling you out because I didn't see Java or C Sharp or whatever the, the language is. It means I took five seconds and your resume was completely disjointed and you had this job in 2007 and then all of a sudden you're job into 2014 and then now we're back in 2008. So the cover letters, I think that has transitioned in the last, very recently, to instead of doing cover letters, sending personal emails and giving them a glimpse into your personality, especially if you're at a small company and you can quickly do some research, it's showing us, A, that you're putting in effort to find us, and B, giving that little extra thing, right? Like, one of, I, I read this email from a lady and she was applying to be our executive administrator or chief of staff or whatever she ended up being called. Um, she took the time to write what would have been a cover letter, but she wrote it in an email. And at the top of it was all about her personality. So it was verbiage appropriate for her personality. And then she had a line that said, now for the professional side. And then she wrote the same thing, just in a very formal way. And as soon as I saw that, I knew she was gonna get hired. Because it's different, right? Regardless of what her resume looked like. I knew that was it. So I, I think it's transitioned a little bit in, in very recent times. If you can find the right contact in the recruiting world that can take that and give it to the manager if you're working with an agency, or find the right recruiter internally if you're working with directly with the, the company, that's what's gonna set you apart more than a cover letter that we don't read anymore. So you wrote a killer resume, you got through the ATS, you got through maybe the first line interview on the phone. Now you're speaking to somebody on the phone that can really help make a difference. What is it that are the warning signs? What do you ask? And how do you know whether or not a candidate over a phone that you can't get body language, you can't see their expressions, that would interest you enough to take them to the next level? <laughs> <clears throat> so, so you would, and I kind of harked on this earlier, you'd be surprised by the number of people that we just asked, not what you did on the project, but what is the project you worked on that cannot answer that question. So if it gets past me, it goes to the hiring manager, inevitably the number one thing we get rejected for is this person didn't know what their company did or didn't know what the overall project is. So that's, that's a really big one for us <clears throat> that a lot of candidates will struggle to overcome. Um, the other thing that candidates struggle to overcome, and I know you're nervous, it's an interview, um, is okay, now you've told me, what did you do, what was your, you know, what was the big picture, but what was your specific piece? And people switch because they've been taught to, oh, we did this, we did that. And then the manager wants to know, yeah, but what was your part, right? So like, I was on a team that developed this, but I might have actually not done any of the development, I just might have been on the team, right? And so then we find that, people then mess up on their individual piece, right? So those are two keys for us. Like you gotta know the big picture and you gotta speak to what you have done. I recommend, by the way, practicing common questions um, that you will get asked by multiple hiring managers, uh, especially if it's a technical question, um, because it will just be easier for you, you'll be less nervous um, and more likely to just sound confident on the phone. Um, I would add research. You know, know what know what company you're talking to. Obviously, a lot of times we're applying to multiple jobs, and you need to know which company you're talking to. You need to know what they do, and you need to have an understanding of who you're talking to. Feel free to look up that person on LinkedIn, see what they do. Maybe you have a common connection with them. Maybe you guys 
or um, have gone to a similar uh, group like this, or a um, you guys went to the same college or something like that, some icebreaker, um, and and just know what you're talking about when it comes to your resume. So I've got two things there. One is GTSF, which is Google that stuff first. So Google the questions that are most likely to be asked, because managers are going, they're not all created equal. So a lot of them will just grab questions that you have now Googled and ask you those questions and now you're more prepared, right? So GTSF. The second one is have a highlight reel all about you. What have you done professionally that you're proud of? Whether it's at the current job, the job before that, a culmination of all of those things, but be able to talk about something in a way that makes them understand your passion so that they know, okay, cool. I, even, even if he did this object-oriented language instead of this one, well, that person's passionate enough, they're gonna spend the extra couple of weeks jumping over into that new language. So, GTSF and have a highlight reel. And I would like to add, answer their question yeah. with a specific situation or story and then stop talking. <laughs> yeah. Because you would not believe the number of people that think they need to fill the full 30 minutes and they, you don't get to ask the five questions that you have to ask and it takes you too long. So answer their questions specifically, concisely, and then shut up. <laughs> and let them ask the next question, right? Um, Swapna. Um, I have a general question. It's uh, mainly, what's the supply demand uh, characteristics or forecast in your seeing? Are you getting enough resources that you are looking for? Is there any gap? Uh, are we in a situation there will be not enough talents? Do you see those things on the wall? Or what's your view on that? So is there really a war for talent? Is that the, the question? Especially I'm keeping aside the Amazon coming. Let's sure. <laughs> so kind of going to what Kate said earlier, lifespan's two and a half years. So literally every day people are changing jobs. What that means to us is it's really important to have that network. For me, so far, I have a 30-day window. From the time I start looking for a job till chances are good I have a qualified candidate, unless it's one of those weird niche roles, it's generally 30 days. So to your point, I haven't experienced the supply-demand piece other than those really, really niche roles. Like I know some companies are switching over to doing mobile development with Xamarin. It's a new thing, so it doesn't exist um, more than like a year, maybe year and a half of experience unless they actually worked at Microsoft on that project. Um, so those take a little bit more time for me, but the rest I haven't experienced it. Yeah, um, I would say it depends on the skill set that we're talking about, whatever skill set it be. If it's niche, yeah, there's we're gonna have to go out and hunt for it for that person uh, so I would say there's a huge gap uh, in, in the supply and demand and, and I wouldn't even personally narrow it down to even a, a couple of things like right now there's a huge IT and IT being also the network side also the software piece gap in what is available and then you add on to it the can they talk about their experience and, and stop talking at the end and you add on the is there is their site, you know, or I'm sorry, is their resume 12 pages long? You add on that you talk to someone, they're like, well, I just came back from San Francisco and I made 400K. Um, <clears throat> so there are a lot of things 
that disqualify people along the way. And there's there's a huge gap, at least at you know, Cree, we just see the same positions over and over again that we get to the point where we decide, let's just find 10 people internally who have no experience and we will just take a year and a half, put them through a rotation program and train them because we just cannot find people um, externally, right? That, that will fit a lot of those pieces. I have a specific question for you. <laughs> Me? Yeah. Okay. And especially in IoT, yeah. how are you seeing the talents coming? It's a slow process, it's new. Uh, do you have any uh, enrichment program that you offer so that we can encourage our community to learn quickly, be on the job, and try to be productive and help the companies like you? Yeah, that's a good question. So I, I would say that we, we don't um, yet. So where we have been lucky in recruiting IoT, and, and this is, is true and it's gonna sound funny, but you just took on a new job in a new company that's starting IoT and you hate that company, right? And it has been six months, it's a brand new project, and you're just not getting along or you don't like the direction they're headed. Um, but we have tried to do things. We have sent, so, so our director of IoT has gone, he's, spoken to the Technical Recruiter Association, now the, now the Recruiter Association. Um, we had someone speak on, on data IoT um, as well. So we are trying to get people out there to talk about these things um, because a lot of companies are doing it, right? Or they're starting it up. So we don't even necessarily look for people with five years of experience. We're just looking for people who have even tried it and even understand what it means. Do you encourage, sorry for continuous <laughs> Do you encourage other small companies who are working on IoT uh, and um, kind of mentoring, culturing, uh, encouraging and getting the new IoT engineers? Do you collaborate with those companies? So not on a company basis, but in terms of the IoT team, they do a lot of work. Um, and and not, <clears throat> not like partnerships or mentorships, but in terms of mentorship. But I wish we did something like publicly, like like it just has Korea as a whole, but we don't. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We have time. Do we have time for one more? Yeah, question? we have time for one or two more. If anyone has any questions. One more question. Yes, please. Okay. You talked about cover letters or introductory emails. Now I'd like to go to the other end. Thank you emails. Um, I've done a lot of contract work. I've worked for several different uh, consulting companies. And only recently, I'll say within the last six months, have they asked me to send a cover, or a thank you email to them usually, so they can, you know, make sure it's make sure it's good, and that they send on to whoever I interviewed with. Is this becoming uh, typical? Um, <laughs> I don't know that it ever went out, to be honest with you. Um, if you're not sending a thank you letter, I don't know why you wouldn't be. Um, you know, I don't necessarily ask a person I'm talking to to send me one, almost as a test to see if they will send one. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, but when I get them, it's almost like I'm jumping out of my chair to, um, well, this is, well, you know, this actually brought this candidate up a little bit higher for me. That's my personal opinion. I have the same opinion, and it's not just the email thank yous. It's the, let's say you're going to the Cree office and you just drop a little letter on your way out, right? It's already written, it's generic enough that it's still there, right? The, the content is still there. You're still meeting, hopefully, with the same people that you were planning on meeting with, but leave it open just in case schedules go awry and you can fill in the name accordingly but drop it in their mailbox. Pretty much all of them have the inner office mail or external mail. Drop it in there and still follow up with an email that's more personalized. If you talked about sports or you talked about all these things that you probably shouldn't have been talking about in the interview, um, you know, feel free to highlight those again just to make that extra personal connection. Every, let me make sure this is correct, yes. Every time I've gotten a handwritten thank you, I hired that person. Wow. So take that extra step. How many times have you done that? Yeah, how many times? 
I have only gotten 10 in the last th two years. <laughs> um, um, so I, so I, won't, I won't say anything uh, against what these two folks are saying, because it, it, it's, it's good to do it. But I will say this, as a recruiter, I've never made a decision based upon a thank you letter. My hiring managers love them, but if you don't do it correctly, it will cause you harm. I cannot tell you the number of times I've been called Troy in a thank you letter, and that's not a big deal to me, like Troy is close to Trey, but if my hiring manager gets a thank you letter and it is not their name, they or things are misspelled, which is very common, um, or you say something like, it was so great to talk to Align Technologies today, and you're like, well, wait, we're not Align Technologies. <laughs> You'd be surprised. So like, I, it, it, it can hurt you, but it will also set you apart. You just, just take a couple extra minutes, make sure you're doing things right. And you know, it, it's also, you'll need, let's like, say you have a panel of five people, or you go through a day of five people, you might only get two business cards. You can probably figure out the other people's emails address based upon that, um, but it's, it's not, hurtful to ask the recruiter um, what are their email addresses. Yeah. Or please pass this along. Yeah, please pass this along. It's good. Okay. One more question. Thanks for the plug, Troy. <laughs> <laughs> One more comment there. Use your recruiter. So even if you do get all those people's email address, use your recruiter. Say, hey, I just wanted a second set of eyes on this. Most of us are human still. So we're, we'll look through that real quick, and if something's blaring, like you decided to use Troy instead of Trey, or Align Technologies instead of Cree, um, we're, we're still people too. But we can absorb that and it not go to the person that you might work for. So even, even with the corporate um, recruiters, like that, you know, you've already gone into the hiring manager circle back around with the corporate um, recruiters, right? I really appreciated when candidates did that. Yeah. Um, at all of the corporate jobs that I've had, uh, if they went through me and I was able to catch mistakes or see that there weren't any mistakes, it didn't really matter to me. But the manager seeing those mistakes would have automatically ruled you out. Have a good last one, Ben. Kate, Ryan, Mark, Trey, thank you very much tonight. It's been a great conversation. Uh, you mentioned in the IT industry, two and a half years is shelf life for a particular role. Uh, how are you all sorting out and dealing with hiring managers that are looking at it and saying, this person's job hobby, or looking at people that have been in contract roles and that's met their lifestyle or their needs or their desire to uh, move through different technology experiences? Um, how are you all seeing that? How do you sort through that? What would you recommend to folks that are looking for roles to uh, how to explain their longevity or lack thereof, or what do you, how are you working with your hiring managers <coughs> to say, listen, this is the norm in the IT industry, you can't call these people job hopping. Um, I know it's a big challenge for folks nowadays. Yeah, great question. Um, personally for me, I will find out, you know, why you, you left, why you left that previous job, why you left the job before that. So now I have a story to tell the hiring manager. So it's, you know, I took leave to take care of X thing, personal life. So now I have a story to tell my hiring manager. So you're, it is more common. It's funny because I, 20 years it was, you're at one company for a long time. That's the person we want to hire. We want that person who's been there forever. Now it's, if you've been there for a long time, what's wrong with that person? <laughs> Hell, <laughs> I'm, I'm aging myself here. Yeah, and this is a chance for a corporate recruiter who, who's good at their job, ask those questions, and, and is able to defend to the hiring manager the story of that person, right? And, and there are so many different reasons. It, it could be contracts. I mean, I've talked to people who literally was like, well, my boss moved and my boss offered me a job and I loved my boss, so I went, right? Like, and now I get to say, this person's been rehired by the same manager. Right, but you do want to make sure that you have your your reasons listed for why you left a particular position, even if it's a, a contract position. What I would recommend to people is that what looks really good contract, right? Well, I mean, if you did find a different way to say it, but if you have continuously completed contracts that were only six months, then you need to throw that in there. Like I, I was there the entire time. I got the, all the objectives accomplished. 
Um, and a good corporate recruiter and even a good agency recruiter will build a story from that that they can share with the hiring manager. And then I frankly would say, if the hiring manager can't look past it after all that, you don't want to work for them. I agree. If the, the hiring manager at this point is looking at two and a half years of job hopping, uh, they have become irrelevant. Um, because that's not how it is today. So to me, most of my hiring managers during the intake meetings, which I did it internally, I did it externally, that's part of what we talk about is, okay, let me just set the stage here. You're gonna see people that have been in a job for 12 months and two and a half years and a year, and maybe they jumped around every nine months. But here's what that means. That means that they're able to quickly adapt to our environment or the skill set that we need because they've done it. The last five years, they had four different jobs. Each time, they had to adapt. Now, if we look at your experience and it's a month and you're jumping every month, that's a completely different story. Um, and I don't know that I would get to hear that story. But <laughs> as long as it's, it's a longer tenure than that, then it's a different conversation. And if you're the one spinning it to the, the manager, you know, let's say you're at a networking event and you're kind of talking about your experience, you want to highlight it in the things that you've learned. Like I was able to contribute X at that project and I contributed X at that project um, so that they know that you're able to, to quickly adapt. Awesome. All right. I'm going to cut it. With that, thank you very much. Let's give the panel a hand, please.